Oh, Capcom. You sneaky buggers, you. Just as I was getting to work on another video, all wrapped up with the audio recording, you had to just drop the newest trailer for Monster Hunter Wilds the next day. So, once again, I must briefly divert course to of course talk about the trailer and all of its details. And my my, there are quite a few juicy details to be found within this trailer, some of which you may have perhaps not picked up on, and some you have. Regardless, this video will go over most of the major public details, gameplay mechanics and more introduced throughout the trailer, as well as bits of speculation and theory crafting in my part with what we could expect to see in the rest of the game. So, let's get started. Obviously, the first thing to talk about in the grand scheme of things here is the trailer itself, and the structure of it. Like the announcement trailer of Hidden World, it's a bit more of a cinematic trailer, showcasing off the new world we will be exploring, and some of the new mechanics throughout. There's not a lot of outright hunting or multiplayer action to be found here, so people who are going in expecting to find that might be disappointed. Ultimately, looking back at the first few trailers of World, I think we can look forward to seeing more hunting and multiplayer in the next trailer. What we do see here, though, is incredibly important, getting an establishing shot of the sand ship many hunters are familiar with from the Gen Moran and Darn Moran hunts, and the crew we will be working with in our expedition. We see the gear our hunter and Palico will be wearing at the start of the game, being the same one from the announcement trailer. A bunch of new characters get introduced in the next few moments, with two right from the get-go. On the right being Gemma, a blacksmith responsible for crafting our armor and weapons, and on the left Alma, our personally designated handler who will be assigning us on our quest. Immediately, there's a couple of interesting points to note here. For starters, the use of the handler. Handlers didn't exist in any Monster Hunter game before World, being a concept created by the Guild and Research Commission in order to explore the New World continent. Each hunter was paired with a respective handler, forming a small team dynamic with each member of the five fleets. Seeing as how that word is being used here, as well as, spoiler alert, several mentions of the Research Commission in the bios for Hunter and Gemma, it is safe to assume that they play a heavy role into the narrative and why we are here. Speaking of why we are here, we also know what here even is. According to the official Monster Hunter Wilds website, the area we are exploring in-game is officially known as the Forbidden Lands being assigned to that specific branch of the Research Commission in order to help investigate the Uncharted region. It's worth noting also that in at least the Japanese text, your employer is instead referred to as by this, which is a different kanji than the one used to refer to the Research Commission by in World. In fact, the direct translation of a text means Forbidden Land Research Team, rather than New World Ancient Dragon Research Group, further confirming my idea that this is some kind of subgroup within the Guild or Research Commission that is dedicated to studying just the Forbidden Lands. Though that all leaves the big question of where exactly the Forbidden Lands are. Obviously, judging by the Research Commission's involvement, the use of handlers, slainers, and scout flies for the hunters, the most likely candidate is somewhere within the New World. As for where exactly in the New World this could be, we have no idea. The largest chunk of unexplored area is the Great Ravine, a massive crevice located in the middle of the continent that, according to the Dive to World book, blockaded the Research Commission's efforts for years, dividing the continent into an upper and lower region. We only get to see the Great Ravine once in World with the Zora Magdros mission, as well as a little bit of the arena there, and the introduction mission to the Coral Highlands. For all the info though, I doubt it is the Great Ravine. The location we see in Wilds is too wide open and varied to be located within a single ravine, and there is no sign of the towering mountains that create its borders. 
The only other location in the world in Iceborne's map we know of that this could be is the landmass located to the very bottom right in the corner. However, there is the very obvious question of how many locales we could see in this game, if there will be anything other than the desert we see. If there is, then there really isn't much ground here to support those other environments. Another thought I had was that it could rather be someplace closer to the old world, judging by the use of the Dragon Sand ship that is native to parts like Loklak and Val Harbor. Not to mention, others have speculated that this forbidden land could be located somewhere within the Fonron region of the world, a section of land located to the top right of the Old World that is home to sites like the ancient Tower Ruins, as well as the Great Forest. However, considering the use of the words to describe this location being forbidden, as well as uncharted, it is more likely that it is a new part of the new world that, up until this point, had been closed off entirely, with nobody allowed to enter it by law of the guild. It wouldn't be the first time in the series bans are created and then lifted on regions or monster populations by the guild, nor is it all too strange considering their attitude. There is even a small detail by Alma in the trailer if we skip ahead, saying, Now commencing the hunt by order of the guild! showcasing that perhaps in this game, we might see more of the guild's overarching influence when it comes to approving quests and hunting bans. A detail that, though has always been in the series, has never been fully seen or explored in the games. The only other named character left to see at the beginning here is Nada, whose only attributing characteristic according to the website is a mysterious young boy that accompanies you on your journey. Because of a lack of details at this point, it is hard to say what exactly this reason could be, or the degree of mystery being mentioned here. My immediate thought considering Gemma's voice line here was that we could be on the search for them, but we see them on the boat here with us. Rather, what I think is more likely here is that Nada is perhaps a native of the Forbidden Land. A lot of emphasis is obviously being placed on the necklace he has, and combined with the bracelet of bees on his right arm as well as attire, it gives me the vibe that Nada isn't someone who belongs to the research commission or guild. He looks out of place in attire compared to everybody else, with each of the major characters here having a key trait that points to a role in the field. Alma with the book as your handler, and Gemma's belt of equipment, goggles, as well as Kutku plush and jacket, marking her not only as the smithy, but also someone with very heavy connections to Little Miss Forge and the Caravaneer from 4U, a connection we'll get to in a moment. He also noticeably stands out farther on the ship compared to everyone else, closer to the front. Classic narrative imagery for someone being a loner of the group, feeling isolated and looking for something. Nada also looks to be pushed into the room when the hunter is flashing back to their initial meeting, marking this as a significant reason for why they are embarking on the journey. Oh yeah, and speaking of that flashback scene, we get our last major, but currently unnamed character of the trailer right here. Obviously considering his broad, rigid stature, the hands behind his back, as well as the extremely detailed embroidery on his shoulders, collar, and necktie, combined with the respect he is given in the room having the banners of the guild, this is someone of extremely high status. He is tall enough in the chain of command to not just report on the situation, but actively organize a high priority assignment for the guild and research commission. Again, up till this point, the Forbidden Lands is exactly that. Forbidden. So, this is the man most likely in charge of removing the ban on traveling to this location. Besides that, everything else is speculation, and I have seen many people pointing out that his broad stature and facial hair bears a striking resemblance to yet another For You character, the Ace Lancer. Considering the Ace Cadet, who we now know as Aiden, and his appearance in a World and Legends of the Guild animated movie, it wouldn't be that far of a stretch to see another member of the squad return. Though, it would definitely be crazy if that is the case, 
seeing a man climb this high up the ladder in politics. Also, from what I'm hearing, the dude sounds like he is voiced by Patrick Seitz, so that's immediate brownie points for me. We move onwards from all those character introductions into the main meat and bones of the game, the monsters and gameplay. And it is here where we get a major look at one of the main systems of the game. Taken directly from the Monster Hunter Wilds website, each hunting locale features an environment with two dynamically changing identities, one in which the region is harsh and unforgiving, where ravenous monsters fight for limited resources, and another in which the region is vibrant and brimming with life. This is an incredibly important detail to consider, because it tells us that it isn't just weather effects that are getting a major focus like we all initially thought, but rather how the environment shifts over time. The dev interview video which came out shortly after the trailer confirms that this dynamic is one of the main objectives they focused on with Wild's development, wanting to show how environmental changes affect the ecosystem. For many old school players around the DOS era, this brings to mind the short-lived inclusion of Seasons, where materials, monsters, and more would change and even be exclusive based on the season in game. Now, as for how this will play out, I'm not too sure. It is certainly an interesting idea, but it could and did present inconveniences in the past in terms of building up resources or needing specific monsters. Having the freedom to hunt and gather what you want at a certain point is a key component of these games, especially towards the end. So, I'm not sure if people would be all too excited about being potentially denied that freedom, especially newer players. That said, lots of time has passed since then, and if people can give the benefit of a doubt for underwater combat, then I think it is only fair to see how this mechanic shapes up to be and whether or not it will also bring back Seasons. Alongside the weather and Seasons, another key point of the game seems to be that several monsters can form herds with one another, and not just herbivores. It is here where we get confirmation on the name of two prior monsters we had seen before. The Karatnov, herbivores with lightning rod backs on certain specimens, and the Doshaguma, our first confirmed feigned beast of the generation, who are aggressively territorial. We see this aggression display firsthand in cutscene and gameplay, though it quickly gets broken up by the hunter grabbing some ammo from the sacred and scaring off the smaller members with some falling stones. Oh, by the way, sacred is this thing our specially designated mount for the game that we will use to navigate the Forbidden Lands and this first location the Windward Plains. This is another cool detail to see, as it confirms not only some actions we can do on our mount, but also some changes to the Slainer, that being that we can pick up stones from a distance, immediately loading them into the Slainer for use. I'm pretty sure in saying this wasn't something we could do in World or Iceborne, so this is a quality of life adjustment in terms of gameplay. Our next big showcase of monsters is with a brand new specimen, and what definitely seems to be the fan favorite according to what I can see. The Chatacabra, a new amphibian who uses their saliva to attach stones and other minerals to their arms in order to hit harder. Which is quite cool and all, but the main thing I want to talk about here is once again with the sacred. That being, as the hunter is getting hit here, the sacred comes in moments later to get him out of there. This feels like to me a redo of the Wirefall gimmick of Rise, with some more restrictions in place. For one, listen to and pay attention to how the sacred doesn't come in immediately, rather after the hunter whistles. The time it takes for the sacred to come in the moment the hunter whistles is about 4 seconds, meaning that using the sacred as a get out of jail free card isn't exactly as free as Wirefall. You are still getting hit and knocked onto the ground because of your missed timing. That said, the sacreds could also depend on proximity, 
as in another clip, it is noticeably quicker to come to the rescue, coming up from the right of the Doshiguma that is attacking. We also see here confirmation of what the pouch on the Sacred does, storing a second weapon for hunters to swap to should they need to. Considering some of the opinions of certain people in the community, I'm curious to see how this gets implemented in practice, what the limitations are, and if it could serve as anything else like an item pouch. I mean, we already know that the seasons or adjustments to the ecosystem in this game will be affecting the monsters, so if that brutal change in the ecosystem could make the monsters harder, then who knows, this might actually be a very necessary addition, especially if it reduces or just gets rid of the campsites from World. Maybe that'll be the case. Who knows. By far the biggest shakeup in the gameplay, though, is what we see next. Introducing the Focus Mode. This function allows us to better aim our attacks and guard abilities, pinpoint monster weaknesses, and inflict special moves should they connect. The moment I saw Greatsword pull this shit out of its ass and move in like that, the first thought I had in my mind was a Frontier's Extreme Style Greatsword, which also had a guard parry system, as well as either the Storm or Heaven style, with a bigger emphasis on the slashing attacks from the true charged slash. What's of particular note here, however, is the focus on the heavy damage bit with focus mode, as it seems like we can end up scratching up the monster's skin as seen by the Doshiguma here, which noticeably has scratched up skin on its back legs, as well as a red glow around its forearms and head. This obviously seems like a reuse of the Clutch Claw's tenderizing mechanic, a highly controversial addition to Iceborne, which allowed hunters to clutch onto body parts and soften them up for damage. Some weapons it worked better with, and others... not so much. So, I'm curious to see what adjustments they'll be making to the mechanic here. Since focus mode is almost like a stance you initiate rather than a gadget you pull out, there could be a variety of actions you can engage in, allowing the fight to still feel fluid and dynamic without slowing down. I also have to wonder what the cooldown on this hard damage is, or how long it can be around for, as that was yet another element of tenderizing that many people disliked. Even still, the ability to perform moves like these and even hold the mouth of a Doshiguma open seems tempting as all hell, and I can see myself having a lot of fun with it depending on what some of the weapons get as their focus actions. My only hope is that it doesn't get too easy to spam them and become reliant on for maximum damage, as was the case for a lot of Silkbind Arts and Sunbreak. And in terms of gameplay mechanics and story additions, that covers the trailer and what I can cover with my own two eyes. Obviously, there are a lot more minor details to inspect in the trailer, many of which people have already picked out like the alligator small monster, what looks to be a baby Puke Puke, as well as the fact that our hunter is now fully voice acted for the first time, which is... Hmm... Strange. Can't say I'm surprised, though, considering Rise was already experimenting with the voice lines. Who knows, maybe this could make it so that our hunter is less a blank slate and more properly defined. Perhaps having an established origin and arc. Maybe even an origin you can choose from, like what other games do. Regardless, though, I am ending it there because this video can only go on for so long and I am not nearly smart enough to try and dig up more secrets, or money hungry enough to continually milk the same trailer across multiple videos. We have yet another trailer confirmed for Summer Games Fest on June 7th, so we are just going to have to see what new monsters, locations, armors, weapons, and more we will see in the trailer. I have a feeling we might just see the main flagship of the game. With all that being said, Thank you all for tuning into this video and giving it a listen. I do really appreciate the support you have given to the channel as of late. And as always, I have been the Monarch of Dragons, and I hope you all have a fantastic day, slash night, wherever you live.
Peace and cool as faults.